So tonight's topic is our um, 2019 4-H and FFA Spring Contest. Um, I'm going to double check one thing right now, though, um, making sure that I'm sharing the screen. I didn't even think about that. So it would be important that you guys see what I see and not just me. Okay. So this should be ready to go. There we go. All right. Um, so hopefully everybody can see the PowerPoint that we're going to go through. Um, so just wanted to let people know uh, some information about our spring contests. And again, if folks have questions, feel, uh, feel free to ask at any point in time. So um, I'm pretty much just going to go over some of the contests that are available for um, the communication contests. And certainly I can talk about a few others uh, if anybody's interested. Uh, who can compete, some of the rules, as well as some tips for preparing youth for um, these contests. So the next one that's coming up is the first weekend in February. So that is the Horse Topic uh, Communication Contest. That's the first Saturday in February, February 2nd, and we do that in the Animal Science Building on campus in um, the Animal Science Building. So for this contest, this is for 4-Hers only, so you do have to be enrolled in the Oklahoma 4-H program. And it is important because this is one of those qualifying contests. Um, any student that is interested in participating, we need to have you completed all of your 4-H enrollment 30 days before the contest. So if you could get that done by January 3rd, then we'd make sure you're eligible. Um, and then parents, um, that want students to participate. Entries are going to be due to my office on January 21st. That's a Monday. And remember, those have to be signed off through your county educator. So they are the ones that actually send those forms on to me. So that means that you need to get your information to them uh, before then. So we have a number of contests that the students can compete in um, on that day, as well as some that actually take place a little bit uh, earlier. So we have uh, traditional kind of speech contests, and I'll talk about what's the difference between those. Um, we have some team contests, um, as well as quiz bowl. So team problem and quiz bowl are both um, team events. And then we also have a photography contest, and so those entries are actually submitted Previous to the contest, um, we just announced results that day. And so all the pictures that you guys will be seeing in my uh, slideshow today are all pictures that the students have submitted over the years, and I picked some of my favorite ones. So general rules for the horse topic communication contest. Um, students can enter two speech contests. So there is a limit, we, and there's only three, so you can do two out of three. You can do the speech contest, uh, the individual illustrated, or the um, team one. But they can enter um, additional ones that include the team problem as well as quiz bowl. So the, the limit is just two speech contests. Um, for the team problem, those are teams. And so we're looking for three to four kids to compete on that team. So that's the correct number. And then quiz bowl uh, it would be four to five kids per team. And again, remember, the key on this is we need to get everybody enrolled um, 30 days prior so that they can compete in these contests. So speech contest. So this is an individual contest. So the student is going to stand and deliver their own speech. Um, and we'll talk about other types of events in a minute. But for this one, it's a memorized speech that the student gives without any extra steps. So they don't have props, they don't have PowerPoints, poster boards, et cetera. It's just a speech. Um, ideally, it should be around seven to 10 minutes in length. So we do want the kids to practice ahead of time. Um, and that's important because they actually do get penalty points if they go over or under that time. The important thing to remember, while we would like to think about our speeches entirely memorized, um, and ready to be given in front of um, big audiences, it is okay if students use notes. So yes, they will lose points for that, but if students are just trying this out for the first time, it is okay that they bring something in there with them. So I'd rather see that they get started with speech contests in general and, and not really panic about, oh, I can't have anything with me in that room. 
So uh, the speech contest is going to be judged certainly on the content of their speech. So they need to make sure they introduce their topic well, that it's organized, and they have good information. But the speech contest is also judged a little bit more heavily on how good an orator essentially the student is. So how good are they at delivery, voice inflection, um, and emphasis, and um, just their how they act uh, in front of that audience. So that's going to be a bigger part of the speech contest. So this is really um, looking to polish up their presentation skills. Uh, if we contrast that to what an illustrated presentation is, so with an illustrated presentation, the students essentially have a visual aid. So I guess that's probably the best way to think about it. This speech contest has visual aids. So most students use PowerPoint, um, and so that's pretty normal. They would prepare that ahead of time, and they bring it with them to the contest, and then we load it on the computer in the presentation room. But it doesn't have to be PowerPoint. Again, it's just something with visual aids. So if they want to bring a saddle or poster boards or grooming equipment, anything um, that will work. And for a lot of students, that sort of takes the pressure off of, oh, the only thing that the judges are looking at is me because they're either, oh, they're looking at the screen while I'm doing the PowerPoint or they're looking at these other things that I have there. So this might be a, a easier way to introduce um, speech contests for students. Um, it can be a little bit longer, so 7 to 12 minutes is our ideal time. Um, they do have penalties if they go over or under time. And again, remember, they should bring a flash drive with them with their PowerPoint. So make sure that they would have practiced ahead of time um, and all of their uh, graphics and everything are working correctly before they come the day of the contest. Uh, so how is this one judged? It is largely the same as the speech contest, but the difference is we reduce the uh, emphasis on stage presence and delivery and put a little bit more emphasis on how it's organized and their content. So again, it's a little bit more of what is the basis of the speech, the facts and things like that versus just their um, orator skills. So again, a great, great place for students um, to get introduced into speech contests. The other option, uh, which is a nice one as well, is students can team up um, to do a team illustrated. So again, this would mean visual aids, but there's two of them. So sort of that safety in numbers idea, they're not up there by themselves. Um, so they're giving the same speech. So it's not like uh, half the time is one kid and half the time is the other. They're still talking about uh, the same topic. It can be a little bit longer because two of them are giving that speech. So we'd increase the total time allowed to 15 minutes. Um, and the other nice thing that you can do is kind of do a mixed age. So you could have a senior member kind of encourage a junior member and ease them into it. They'd be there in the room with them, helping them out a little bit. It's just, again, a nice way to introduce speech contests. So again, scoring would be the same um, on that type. So tips for preparing students on our um, uh, on some of these speech contests. So uh, I would really encourage folks bring them uh, to contests and watch. So if the first year, maybe they just want to see how this whole thing works, um, we definitely allow students to come and watch the speech contest. So you can sit in the room and kind of get a feel for what all is involved. The other thing I would recommend is really pick something that the youth is interested in. So it's going to be easier for them to be passionate and to spend some time researching it things like that if it's something they really like. Um, just some other practical tips, um, building an outline ahead of time is going to be really key. So um, kind of structure your whole speech so that it makes sense, so that you do have an introduction, all of your points sort of make sense, and then you have a conclusion. So really starting with an outline will really help. Um, the other big thing about speech contests is make sure that you practice at home, so in the comfort of your own house to begin with. Um, and then uh, even practice giving it to other 4-Hers, practice at local club meetings. All of that's going to get you used to uh, speaking in front of an audience so that once you come to campus, it's not going to be quite as scary. So team problem, this is actually one of my uh, favorite events. So this is held at the same time as the speech contest. We do make sure the kids don't have any conflicts as we go. We work pretty hard at organizing um, their order of go and the schedule. 
Um, but it's a little bit different type of an event. So in this one, we have, again, three to four kids on a team. Um, and it really tests their teamwork, their problem solving ability. Um, it also does oral communication skills. But to me, the interesting part of this is it tests their horse smart. So what is the depth of their knowledge about a topic? Um, so the students have to spend some time researching the topic um, that I give them for that year. So essentially what we do, um, once I have all the enrollments and we've hit the enrollment deadline, so that January 21st date, I then send a hint out to the teams that are enrolled in Team Problem. So essentially then they have uh, almost two weeks to spend some time researching that topic and making sure that they have a okay breadth of knowledge about that topic. So last year, uh, for example, I did first aid. So that was their hint. So they had to know things about first aid for horses. And then that was essentially one of the problems that they had. So the format for team problem, um, the teams will go into a prep room. So they go into the prep room where they're just themselves, their teammates. They don't have any way to Google, no iPads, no smartphones, anything like that. It's got to come out of their noggins. Um, and that's where they get the question. So the question is on the table. And so the kids can gather around. They can use uh, notebook paper and take notes and prepare what they're going to say, talk about it, etc. Plan out what they're going to do. And then they will go in a room and give a presentation to our judges. So the presentation, um, it's not super long because this is, you know, this is extemporaneous. So this is why I really like this uh, contest. They can't practice ahead of time. They just have to you know, know the topic. Um, and the goal of a team problem is also that all of the students actually participate uh, and give part of the answer when they're in the room. So how do we score it? So um, there's some organization and a little bit of presentation skills, uh, but we're also really looking to see, are they able to um, do the question? So um, do they have all of the answers? Um, does it make sense? Do they have some good information to support, you know, how they would solve the problem, so to speak? And we also want to see that all of the students are participating, so they kind of get a score of, you know, did everybody use the same amount of time or did we have just a younger student that maybe only said a few things, et cetera. So how, how well prepared was everybody? So I just thought it would be fun to share uh, some of the, uh, just sharing two of the past team problems. Um, they won't be this, this, this year. So uh, I'll just read it. Um, so last, or a couple of years ago, I said, congratulations, you've been hired as the junior consulting team by the City Council of Hera, Oklahoma one of the top 10 growing cities in Oklahoma. Just 22 miles outside of Oklahoma City, it boasts about its strong public schools and open spaces. This has led to an influx of formerly urban residents seeking a bit of the country lifestyle. The increase in hobby farms and ranchettes have been explosive and of course, everyone is planning acreage for horses. The town has been getting many calls asking for help in planning their near home. So these are some of the calls they received. So these are the questions then that the students would have to answer. Of course, my cats are fighting right now. Um, so what can my horses eat? What type of fence should I use? Um, do I have to feed my horse if I have five acres? How do I get my pastures? So I'd cite some pictures of some really, really barren pastures and then some really pretty pastures. Um, how many horses can I have at my new place? Where do I put the horse manure? Do I put it in my trash? What grass do I plant? So the, the cool here is that the students really thought about all of these questions when they came into the room to give their advice. So um, kind of a fun way to incorporate pasture management, horse management, a little bit of horse nutrition as well. So here's another example. This one was based around um, exercise physiology. So um, as the most knowledgeable members about horses in your county, you've been tasked with helping out your fellow 4-H members get ready for the show season. Your 4-H'ers that you have been helping haven't been riding much this winter due to school activities. In fact, their horses haven't been ridden since November. And so this would be taking place in February and they're uh, supposed to get the horses ready for show season. So these were the questions they had to answer. What advice would you give them in getting their horses ready to show at their district horse shows, which um, most of them now still are at the beginning of June. Um, some of them have pleasure horses, some have reining horses, some have barrel horses. What would your advice, would your advice be the same for everyone? Why or why not? 
Um, and so this was really an exercise physiology question. Um, and so what we were looking at, pleasure horses, reining horses, and barrel horses do very, very different things. And so if you're getting them fit, you have different fitness requirements for a pleasure horse and you would have a reining horse and has to exercise at higher intensities. So we were looking to see, do the students really understand some of that? Um, how do they understand fitness assessment in horses? Etc. So just kind of general, uh, how much information do they have about exercise physiology? Okay, so moving on to Quiz Bowl. I usually do get quite a few questions about Quiz Bowl. Um, so for a, an official team that can move on, um, we need four to five youth from the same county. And that is, so if they do win our Quiz Bowl contest, that they can compete in other national events. But what we've added this year, because let's say you're in a county that doesn't have a really robust uh, horse program, I know, that would be horrible, uh, we still want to encourage students that are interested to try and compete. So what we're going to do this time is that if you do have kids that want to compete in the quiz bowl but you don't have a full team, we will enter them essentially in kind of a random draw. So they would still get to compete on a team. We would just sort of create some mixed teams and they could still compete for all of our uh, awards and prizes. Um, but if that particular team would win, um, that would not be the team that would advance on to Denver Nationals. <laughs> for some of our <laughs> Nothing like having a border collie sneak your head in the middle of this. So it's all good. <laughs> so, um, so typically we want to make sure that the kids can uh, get to play at least one more match. Um, so we do either a consolation round tournament, so the kids would always at least compete in two matches. Um, last year we had some illnesses across the state, so uh, we didn't have as many teams as normal, so we ended up doing a double elimination tournament. Um, so you can guarantee you're going to get to do two, two games. Um, and it will just depend on our total numbers of how many uh, rounds we actually play. And for Quiz Bowl, you don't have to be there the entire day of the contest. We don't start Quiz Bowl until the afternoon, so um, you can come in. Generally, we say we don't start before 1 on the Quiz Bowl contest. Uh, so if you need to sleep in a little bit before you get there for Quiz Bowl, that's fine. So uh, quiz bowl format can be a little confusing. So essentially there's two um, halves to a match. So the first part of the game is a head-to-head -head competition. So essentially you've got four kids on the buzzers. And so the ones that are seated um, closest in, so they're typically the team captain, so they would be like um, A contestant and then B, C, and D. So as you go down the row of the buzzers, um, the kids would be numbered or, or lettered A, B, C, D. So when we do head-to-head -head competition, so team uh, or teammate A for both teams, they're the only one allowed to answer. So it's really two kids that whichever one of those two kids hits the buzzer gets to answer. Then we move to contestant B. Um, then C, then D. So essentially it's testing only the ability of that same matching chair against the other team. So it's not everybody buzzing in, it's just those two kids. So then um, we do 12 questions, so every kid gets to play that way, so they get their 50-50 um, shot at answering a question for three rounds. They still have to buzz in. Um, if they buzz in and they get it correct, um, they get two points. Um, if they get it wrong, they lose a point. So sometimes if um, kids aren't really certain of an answer, they get a little nervous so they don't buzz in, um, which is fine, but then no points are awarded for that question. Um, but if you do buzz in and give the wrong answer, you do lose a point. And then there's also penalties if the wrong person buzzes in. So that's to keep them paying attention. So let's say it's uh, player C, um, it is their question and player D buzzes in, then they automatically lose two points for their team. So we don't want anybody doing extra buzzing as we go. So after the first 12 questions and our three rounds ahead to head, then it's an all play. So what that means is whoever buzzes in first um, gets the chance to answer the question. So that's where everybody gets real itchy trigger fingers there. Um, so for this one, 
Um, for the regular questions, if you get it right, you earn only one point instead of two. So the point value is actually higher in the head-to-head -head competition. Um, still, though, if you get it wrong, you lose a point. So you have to be, uh, you know, somewhat careful on your buzzing. Um, then we also have questions that are called toss-up questions. So the moderator says, okay, this one's a toss-up. And then whoever wins that question, they get a chance at a bonus question. So the bonus questions are kind of fun. Everybody on that team gets to talk about it. So the moderator uh, reads the question and they get 10 seconds to discuss their answer. If they get it right, they win three points. So three points is awesome. Um, so high stakes game there on the um, uh, bonus questions. Um, if they don't get it right, they don't lose any points either. So it's kind of great to get those bonus questions. And then if nobody gets the toss-up question, um, the bonus question just becomes a regular question. And so it, you know, it's not a conference question. So if you're preparing students for Quiz Bowl, um, here's some of the official resources that you can use to um, create questions or study guide material. So Feeding and Care of the Horse um, by Lon Lewis. So that's an option. The Horse Industry Handbook, um, that's one that's produced by the American uh, Youth Horse Council, so the AYHC. Equine Science um, by Rick Parker. Also Horses by Evans, that one's been around for a long time, so the book there in the middle. Um, and then this is a new one. Uh, it only came out last year. This is also uh, produced by the AYHC, so the American um, Youth Horse Council. So this is a... a, a material called Horse Smarts. So horse, horse Smarts, it's kind of fun. It's organized still by topic, so like breeds and um, tech and equipment and reproduction, nutrition, etc. So it has all of the different topics, but the way it's structured, it's actually an activity book. So it's really a great resource for um, volunteers, um, coaches, parents, et cetera, as kind of fun ways to learn about horses rather than just a book of facts. So I would really encourage any of you guys that are club leaders to look into um, one of these manuals. Um, if anybody is interested in looking at it, I have one in my office. Um, and so certainly at the communication contest, if you're there um, that day and you want to take a look at it, um, just go ahead and ask me and I'll bring it out. Um, the other great way to look for quiz bowl questions is Googling. Um, so a lot of states will list some sample questions. So you can go online and I literally just Googled horse bowl quiz questions. And so you could see, you can find them from North Carolina, from Texas, from Washington, from New York, from Florida, from California. So I would use those as a great way to um, build sort of your quiz bowl banks of questions. So really, you know, Googling is fantastic. So how to uh, prep them for quiz bowl. So think about tackling topics at a time. So on your, whether it's weekly club meetings, monthly club meetings, break or decide what you're going to do as a topic. Um, so for instance, breeds could be a topic, colors could be a topic, tack can be a topic, et cetera. Um, and then depending on the age group that you're working with, you know, if it's a younger group, probably I would start with breeds, colors, and tack rather than starting with like reproductive physiology. So um, just kind of using some, uh, a little bit of knowledge of what the educational level the students are at to make sure that you're, um, Kind of teaching material that's appropriate uh, for that level. So um, if I were kind of trying to put together a team, I would, you know, you got to find the material. So um, those sources, again, are great places to start. Um, and make sure that it's not like just boring lecture. So nobody likes that. That's no fun. Um, so trying to find ways to make it fun or more interactive, really uh, putting a lot of visual components or if you can do any hands-on. Um, had some other great suggestions of, well, maybe bring in guest speakers. So bringing in a farrier to talk about equipment or um, somebody to come in and talk about dentistry or something like that. So it's just um, a new person that has some expertise 
that maybe you don't have that is willing to share some time uh, with those kids. So I would approach it that way first, if you're actually introducing the material. Um, and then you can think about, well, how do I develop questions from that material? So sometimes people have the go about it maybe backwards and just develop questions without teaching material. And then the students are only learning the answer to that question and not really the topic that might allow them to answer more than just that question. Um, and then the other part of it, you know, to be honest, on Quiz Bowl, you got to play with buzzers. So you got to get the kids used to buzzing in um, and making sure that they're confident and kind of get used to their reaction time a little bit. And also, you know, being willing to take risks because you certainly you can't score any points if you never buzz in either. So um, just kind of some tips for that. Okay. All right. So last contest for spring contest is the photography contest. So this has been a fun one, and I really enjoy um, looking at all the pictures, um, and I enjoy using them on some of my other presentations as well. So it is digital. You do not have to print the pictures. All you have to do is email them. So um, really, really simple. I do use a separate email account to collect all of my photography contest email. So those need to go to horsephoto at okstate.edu. Yes, it is still me, and I'm the one that goes through them, but it just allows me to keep them all in one place rather than uh, having them get lost in the huge masses of email that I get. Um, when students are going to send those in, um, they have to send in, well, three things, really. They have to send in a release form, so a signed release form, so they can um, print that off and scan it and send it in. Um, I think we're trying to do some digital signatures as well. And then an entry form. So the entry form tells me what the heck am I even looking at. So I've got the student's name and their address, a little description about their photographs. Um, we have multiple divisions that the students can compete in. Um, and we limit them to just five photos. So they have to pick which class they want to be in. And they cannot submit two photos for the same class. Um, so no duplication in the same type of class. So we divide them into junior and senior um, by grade level. So that would be third grade through um, sixth grade, I believe, and then seventh grade to twelfth grade for our seniors. And here's the topics or the areas that they would submit photos into. So we have horses in action. So we want to see like this horse here is jumping something. So that's a horse in action. We have a horse human bond category. Um, and then horses essentially in a natural state. So that's horses up to their own device. And then of those, so we have those three themes that the, um, the type of photograph, and then we also have original and enhanced. So um, we'll talk about that a little bit. So original, that doesn't mean just the picture as they took it, okay? So they still can do a little bit of altering of that. So they can, what is allowed in the original category is color contrast adjustment. They can crop it, so that's fine. They can do a little grayscaling, exposure adjustments, and red eye reduction. A little picture there, I have some uh, red eye reduction there. Um, enhanced, then we're asking them to do something else, okay? So if they're in the enhanced division, they're going to um, do an original, or they have to submit both the original as well as the enhanced photo so, so that we can see the difference between um, what, what they started with and what they ended up with. Also on the entry form, we need to give them, or we want a written explanation of what they did. So um, I've got photographers that judge these events so they know, okay, this makes sense, this is what the kids did. Um, and what do they do to alter it? Um, I'm not a photographer, so a lot of those words on the previous page don't make any sense to me whatsoever. Um, I took those from photographers. So, um, but they have to be something beyond what that previous slide did, okay? So, um, I, again, I'm not a photographer. I don't know what that means, but I'm sure those of you out there actually do. So, day of the contest, um, we start registration at 8.30 in the morning in the Animal Science Building, and then we kick off our speech contest at 9 o'clock. We run several rooms at the same time, um, and we're very accommodating. We don't let anybody miss their speech, so don't worry. Um, and then we're also, again, going to do a photography clinic. We did that last year, and that went really well. Um, we're really happy with that. People are really pleased, so we're going to do that again. 
So we actually have an AgCom student that is going to be giving that clinic um, that day um, at 10 o'clock. So um, we'll have them in a separate room and then they'll use the youth's photographs and talk about this is what they would do to make it better or what the student did that was great because a lot of them really were pretty fun little photographs. Um, and then after we finish all of those um, speech contests, um, which it does include Team Problem, we do our morning awards. So we do all the awards for speech, individual illustrated, um, Team Problem, and they also do the photography awards. So we get those all done. So if you're not in Quiz Bowl, then you are free to go in the afternoon. Um, if you did compete in the photography contest, oh, that's a cat. Um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, and, and you didn't come to the actual communication contest, then that one, uh, we will mail your awards to you. So don't worry, we'll still get everything to you. We just will mail them instead. And then I usually try to post them on Facebook and things like that, the pictures, because I, I think a lot of people get a kick out of seeing our great photos the students take. Um, and then in the afternoon, we do quiz bowl. Um, so after lunch, we actually start the quiz bowl contest, and so that's really fun, um, kind of a highlight event for the kids, and I like quiz bowl, so why wouldn't anybody else? So we do quiz bowl, and then at the end of quiz bowl, we go back through. Everybody knows who the winner, because you just watched them win, but we give the awards out, um, and that's how we wrap up the day. So if you had such a great time at communication contests that you want to keep going, there's a couple different places you can go. Um, so the winning um, speech folks uh, and Quiz Bowl can compete at National Western Roundup, um, and that's in Denver. Um, so if you win in February, National Western is the following January. So you'd have quite a bit of time to prepare and decide that you want to go. And we've had some youth do really, really well at those contests. So um, if anybody wants to know about that more, you can ask. Um, also, I just found out if you really love some Quiz Bowl, um, they will be hosting a Quiz Bowl contest for youth at the Dixie National Horse Show. So that's February 16th, so Mississippi's not that far, if you guys are interested in that. Uh, and they actually do run a junior and a senior division contest. So if anybody does have some interest in going to Dixie Nationals, please let me know. Um, Quarter Horse Con Congress does speech contests. Um, they also do some hippology contests. Uh, our hippology contest is held with Roundup, which is in July, and I'll probably talk about that at a later time. Um, and then AQHA, their Youth World Show, also has some uh, contests as well. So there's multiple places that students can continue on past the state-level contest to do some more um, national contests. So I'd just like to remind everyone that we're going to continue doing our webinar series. Um, so they will be, they're supposed to be on the first Wednesday of the month in January, though I'm going to make an exception and do it on the second Wednesday, um, just because I will be out of town in Kentucky, so I need to be back um, to do that webinar. Um, and then in February, we're going to have Dr. Justin Talley join us, um, and he's going to talk about internal parasites in the horse anthelmintic resistance issues, and then how we can use fecal egg counts to better manage our horses. And we'll try to do some live work with that too with our fun webcams. And then March 6th, uh, Dr. Candice Lyman from CVHS, so our vet school, is going to talk about breeding soundness exams in the mare. Um, so we don't, I want to make sure that I'm not just doing youth events, uh, so we'll also be doing some adult education opportunities or general horse management as we go. So with that, um, thank you guys for joining in. Um, if anybody has any questions, I can certainly um, take them now. Otherwise, I will um, record this and post it and feel free to share with anybody that might be interested. Well, I think we're good. So again, thank you and uh, good luck to those of you preparing teams. <laughs>